three teachings of ancient China. Taoism. Lao Tzu wandered out to the western border of his state, riding his water buffalo. When he was 80 years old, he set out for the western border of China, towards what is now Tibet. Saddened and disillusioned that men were unwilling to follow the path to natural goodness, he searched for a place to live a simple life, close to nature and without trouble. With him, he carried his ideas. Before he could cross the border, officials made him write down his ideas. Live a simple life, be free, be yourself, and be close to nature. Do these things and you will be happy. These words have been kept in a little book called Tao Te Ching and the writing of God's way for a good life. Like Confucius, Lao Tzu had been troubled by the violence of his times. He thought it was a mistake to try to change people. He believed that people were naturally good. Man didn't have to be controlled. Too much control was spoiling man. He saw that men were trying to live by man-made laws, customs, and traditions. They could not do this and were unhappy. If men follow the ways of Tao, they will lead a good life. He really told each man to do your own thing, be yourself. Lao Tzu wanted people to be close to nature. He wanted to get away from the rules made by government and society. To him, the government was selfish and power hungry. In his world, he would have no rules. He would have people live simple and peaceful lives. They would find that their plain food is sweet and that their simple clothes fancy. They would have their war horses become plow horses and their homes would then be happy places. Tao, also written as Tao, means the way to happiness. Taoism is not a religion. It's a philosophy, a way of looking at life and a way of thinking about things. Taoists believe that if you look at life and think of things the right way, you'll be much happier. Taoism, which emerged about the same time as Confucianism, tended to appeal to the underprivileged. Taoists believe it's very important to understand the way things are. This does not mean that there are not things we want to change about ourselves, but it's important to recognize and trust our own inner nature and discover who we are. In the story of the ugly duckling, when does the duckling stop feeling ugly? When he discovers he's a swan. When he realizes who he really is, a beautiful swan, he finds his way to happiness. The followers of Taoism aim to achieve harmony with the principle of the way by stilling and emptying the mind. Tao, literally the path or way, is what Taoism is all about. Following Tao is following the way of Taoism. This way is described in Tao Te Ching, which elaborates on yin, yang, wu wei, governing the three jewels and others. In Taoism, yin and yang are negative and positive principles of the universe. One can't exist without the other, and they often represent opposites in relations to each other. As you have more and more yang, eventually yin will appear and replace this increase. Similarly, in the opposite direction, yang will appear to replace the increase in yin. The yin-yang symbol circle with black and white sections depicts this clearly. As you travel around the circle, white or black will increase until the opposite color is almost gone, but never totally gone. The cycle then repeats for the opposite color. What seems like yin is often supported by yang and vice versa. As an example, to truly know good, you must know what evil is. And without good as a comparison, nothing is evil. Thus, while keeping to one end, do not shun the opposite end, but embrace both as they are. Allowing yin to flourish, you welcome yang. By letting go of yin, you are waiting for its return. As an example, before you can possess something, you must be willing to let it go. Yin and yang often represent opposites. Buddhism. Siddhartha Gautama was a prince who lived in the kingdom of Salkyas, near the present-day border of India and Nepal more than 2,500 years ago. The young prince was raised in great luxury, but was not happy. He wanted to understand what caused human suffering. He did not understand why some people were rich and others were poor, why some were healthy and others sick. Siddhartha left his palace and lived as an ascetic. An ascetic is a person who has few material possessions and has given up all pleasures and comforts. 
He prayed and he fasted. To fast is to eat little or no food. Siddhartha fasted so strictly that he nearly died, but he was still not satisfied. Finally, Siddhartha sat down under a Bodhi tree and determined to understand why he had failed to find a satisfying way of life. Later that night, Siddhartha Gautama became enlightened. Siddhartha told other people of his enlightenment. He became well known for his teaching. Siddhartha's students called him the Buddha, which means the enlightened one. And the followers of Siddhartha's teachings are called Buddhists. The Buddha taught his followers to seek balance in their lives. The path to happiness is neither through indulgence or denial, but a middle way. Siddhartha taught that by putting aside your ego, you can escape the cycle of life and death and a rebirth to reach nirvana. The Buddha was an oral teacher. He left no written body of thought. His beliefs were written by later followers. At the core of Buddha's enlightenment was the realization of the four noble truths. Truth one, life is suffering. This is but a more recognition of the presence of suffering in our lives. It is a statement that in its very nature, human existence is essentially painful from the moment of birth to the moment of death. Even death brings no relief, for the Buddha accepted the Hindu idea of life as cyclical, leading to further rebirth. All suffering is caused by ignorance of the nature of reality and the craving, attachment, and grasping that from such ignorance. Suffering can be, over can be ended by overcoming ignorance and attachment. The path to the suppression of suffering is the Noble Eightfold Path which consists of right views, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindedness, and right contemplation. These eight are normally divided into three categories that form the cornerstone of the Buddhist faith. Morality, which means having good morals, making good choices, wisdom, and concentration. The Chinese people loved life. They thought it was worth living. Why were the ideas of Buddha, who wanted to get away from life, so interesting to the Chinese? When Buddhism came to China around 100 AD, there were many civil wars and much violence. The ideas of Confucius were becoming old. Confucianism was not really a religion. It told people how to act in society, but it did not tell people too much about themselves or their gods. Buddhism gave people a feeling that peace was possible and it called for an end to all violence, all selfishness, and all wars. Millions of Chinese turned to Buddhism. They were good people who hoped to avoid being born again into a life of worry and misery. Buddhism teaches that souls are reborn until they become perfect. Buddhism became a part of the daily life of many Chinese. It became part of their religious ceremonies, their buildings, and their arts. More than anything else, it became part of their attitudes. Confucianism. Confucius was born around 551 BC in Zhao times. His parents were nobility, but had become poor when the empire disintegrated into feudal states. When he was around 15, he became quite interested in learning. In those days, the only the nobility and royalty were allowed education. All the teachers were government officials. It was hard for him to find a way to learn. To solve this, he went to work for a nobleman. This gave him the opportunity to travel to the imperial capital. Confucius studied and learned until he probably was the most learned man of his day. People heard of his knowledge and sent their sons to study with him. He was the first private teacher in China. Confucius taught anyone who was eager to learn. His ideas, called Confucianism, stressed the need to develop responsibility and moral character through rigid rules of behavior. Confucianism is not a religion. It's a way of behaving, so you'll do what's right. Confucianism in Tang times was a social code of behavior, a very set and rigid code of behavior that honored ancestors and ancient rituals. Everything had to be done in a certain manner. One of his rules, for example, was that the gentlemen could display their skill as archers on three hunts a year, in the spring, autumn, and winter. Today we celebrate, or the Chinese celebrate, Confucius's birthday, teacher day, in honor of their teacher, the ancient Confucius. I'm going to continue this recording in a second one. There's not much left, though, okay?